All truth goes through three phases. First, it is ridiculed. Next, it is violently opposed. Finally, it is accepted as self-evident. I consider this quote from the German philosopher Schopenhauer to be essentially the same thing as the much better known quote from Gandhi, first they laugh at you, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. I don't want to get too evangelical about open source today, so I'm not. Don't worry, I'm going to rein it in a little bit. Not all of you have fully drunk their Kool-Aid, I know that. But you will forgive me for taking a little bit of time with it. Um, I've been invited to do the keynote today, which I'm very, very grateful for. Thank you very much. I wondered why that is. My company has a little bit to do with open source, but I concluded that it's primarily because I'm an old guy, probably twice the age of some of the entrepreneurs that we've got here today, and I've been around a bit. My name's Mark Taylor. I am an old guy, and I have been around a bit. I've been involved in open source for a number of decades, and I've seen it go, as the, as the acting dean told us earlier, from this very, very obscure thing to something which is literally world-changing. And I want to examine that a little bit today. I'm here to talk about uh, what's next in open source, in business and the public sector. In order to do that, I need to examine a little bit of how we got to where we are today. Um, anyone who's seen me speak before will know that I don't use notes, I don't use slides, I just stand up and say what it is that I've got to say. I've been talking to a few of you beforehand, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide my talk into talking a little bit about the philosophy of open source and why we got here and why it's important and why actually it's winning. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about business and how we've got to uh, where we are now and the kind of things which are happening in the business world around open source, and that is outstanding. And then I'm going to spend the majority of the time simply because it is really the next frontier and it's where a lot of the really exciting stuff is happening about what's happening in open source in the public sector and the government. And I'm going to base that mainly around my own main experience, which is in the UK government. And I'm probably going to be a little bit indiscreet and spill a few secrets about what's actually happening because I know some of you might be wondering about that. Does that sound okay to everyone? Yeah. 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 Terrific. Okay. So my background is I'm only accidentally a politician and a public speaker. I'm primary, primarily a businessman. I've been involved in open source for a number of decades. I started off slightly triumphantly talking about uh, open source, you know, there's one. The truth is it has. We won the argument. We won the economic argument. We won the technical argument. We won the philosophical argument a long time ago. The only thing which is mysterious about that is why it was never in any doubt. Anyone here who's been around for as long as I, I have maybe will remember the days when open source was described as anti-American, intellectual cancer, all of that kind of stuff. It's not anymore. Everyone talks about it absolutely seriously, absolutely credibly. One of my favorite magazines is The Economist, which I read every week, and there is always an article in there about open source, either in the technology area or in the other fields that it has spread to. The only surprise is why it took so long, why it was ever in any doubt that open source was going to win. Because when you look at it, it is based upon and a restatement of absolutely fundamental principles. If you look historically, the societies which have always done well, that have always won, have been the open societies that are open to new influences, new ideas, and sharing the ideas. Societies and organizations and cultures which are insular, which treat ideas as if they're some kind of, can we switch this light off? I haven't got this one, yes. is that okay? Um, treat ideas as if they were some kind of secret source are the ones that do not work. And historically, if you think about it, it's always <coughs> the open societies which have won. Open source is a restatement of the fundamental ideas of science. And when you think about it, technology is, if it's anything, is applied science. It's mathematics, it's logic, the creation of, of code, these ideas here. Now, in science, it's absolutely an accepted axiom that openness to ideas, the ability to peer review ideas, and the, the ability to look at them and examine them, is the principle on which it goes forward. 
in engineering or in mathematics, if you say, hey, I've solved this particular problem, but I'm not going to tell you how I did that, it, it's laughed out of court. It simply isn't accepted. So the big surprise is why it took so long for the philosophical basis of open source to gain acceptance in the world. The interesting phenomenon that, that we see now is open source has, yes, been completely accepted in technology, but the ideas are migrating to all other fields as well. Everyone spotted that? Not a week goes by when you don't see the application of open source ideas into hardware or into medicine. We <coughs> talk about open source politics, so the, the, the idea has won. That's all the philosophy I'm going to do, but I want to start off <coughs> by saying open source is no longer obscure, it's no longer uh, this cult, if you like, it has gone mainstream and we won the argument intellectually a long time ago. So what's happening in business? I feel slightly embarrassed about talking about what's happening in business, especially at a conference like this, because you know already some of the speakers that you've got here are examples of the power of open source of, uh, systems, and Drupal in our particular case, uh, reaching full acceptance, and you've got case studies around here all the time. Those of you who have open source businesses of your own know that we're talking about major companies who are adopting it. So in the group health space, you've got organizations like The Economist, that they run on open source, some of the other people that you've got speaking around today, lots and lots of people. But where has it spread elsewhere, and what are the kind of trends that we're seeing, and what are the kind of technologies that you're seeing being adopted by it? My assertion is that there are very, very few areas in the world of business where you're not seeing it. So to give some UK examples, let's talk about the heart of business or the heart of capitalism itself. The London Stock Exchange, the core system on which all of the trading is done, sits on top of an open source operating system and it is an open source system that it is being built from. That's the very core of capitalism. UK companies all over the place are adopting open source software, some of our best known brands. So two point spec savers. We've got companies, some of our very, very biggest companies, picking one from, uh, from random, BT, migrating from proprietary database systems and into open source systems. It is literally all over. And if you look in the places where the innovation is happening, it's all happening in the open source space as well. So, some of the trends that we're seeing in the area of data, and especially in the area of big data, companies adopting it absolutely everywhere. New companies uh, who are coming in and delivering services, open source is the driver behind software as a service. Are companies adopting it throughout their infrastructure? Absolutely the case. Since the early 2000s, we've had companies who have built their entire infrastructure around open source, end to end. Uh, most recent example of that, which is happening at the moment, is the <coughs> UK's largest whole food retailer uh, is moving the entire infrastructure, the like entire back end and front end, to an open source operating system. Now, one of the things which keeps being asked is, when are we going to see open source on the desktop? When are we going to see the year or limits on the desktop? I have to tell you, I'm not absolutely a huge believer in that. I don't think we are. I think the desktop has become pretty much irrelevant. If you look in terms of devices, more and more people are using mobile devices and tablet devices, and you see the influence of open source in there all over the place. So don't worry about the desktop, whatever's going to happen with that. It's not where the action is happening. So business, very, very straightforward. The most interesting frontier for open source, I would assert at the moment, is what's happening in the government space. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to tell you some personal stories about it. It was mentioned earlier that uh, I was the founder of the Open Source Consortium. So I did that about 10 years ago. I'm no longer involved in that. 
And the reason I founded it was because I was invited along to a meeting by a government organisation, and this is best part of a decade ago, and they explained to me um, that the reason that open source was not being adopted in the public sector was because open source companies were all individually small and scattered, and if they all got together, um, then the public sector would come along and they would buy lots of open source software for them. And they said they didn't think that would happen. So I took them at their word and I put together an organisation called the Open Source Consortium. And I tracked down the open source companies that I could find in the UK. And it took quite a long time and we had quite a lot of conversations and we brought everyone together. And we came back and we said, OK, we've done it. So now how about all this public sector business? Absolutely nothing whatsoever happened. What I didn't know at the time was that the organisation concerned was separately negotiating with a very, very large proprietary provider who will remain unnamed um, for a very, very large discount on the public sector licences. Okay? As you might imagine, I got a little bit disillusioned at this stage, especially after having put in the best part of the year's work to bring this organisation together. It's like, pfft, had it with politics, really don't want to know, not going to get involved in that. If I want to use proprietary software, so bad, blah, blah, blah. So I kind of stepped down in the activities. Anyway, a little time afterwards, and this is um, it's a little bit past the uh, anniversary of it, but this was in 2007, I got an email. Dear sir, I am the economic advisor to the shadow chancellor. And I'm interested in speaking to some experts about the Labour government's approach to open source software procurement. Could somebody please give me a call on... Someway did. Well, you would, wouldn't you, if you got that one? Um, to cut a very, very long story, very, very short, the question that you have, I know, is how serious is this government about open source software? And the answer is extremely and it goes literally right to the top. This chap is the, um, at the time, the economic advisor to the Shadow Chancellor, is now primary economic advisor to number 10. We had a number of conversations about the possibility of open source in the public sector and what it could mean. <coughs> the conversations were not, you will be surprised, about the relative merits of the BSD license versus the GPL license and degrees of freedom and all of that kind <coughs> of stuff. So one of the points about this and one of the lessons that I derived is that the concerns that we, for those of you here who, who are part of the open source community, have about our inter Nicene rivalries and which license blah, 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 is the right one, are utterly, utterly irrelevant. Customers and businesses and the government and the public sector are only interested in the benefits for them or the benefits for the citizen, or the benefits for their organisation, not interested in the philosophy and religion and all that kind of stuff. So the particular interest of the opposition, who are now the government at the time, were are there economic benefits to open source and its adoption in the public sector? And the conclusion, very rapidly, was absolutely and that conclusion was based upon, I'm ashamed to say at that time, there were very, very few um, public sector organisations using open source. That has changed, especially over the last year or two, and we'll get to that in a little while. Um, but we did introduce them to a lot of the organisations, some of whom I mentioned earlier, in the private sector, who were using it and deriving major benefits to it. Now, some of the benefits which came out of this came later, but the initial benefits that, that uh, these people were interested in were the economic ones. And they saw the economic benefits from private sector organisations who have adopted open source in a big way and saved very, very big sums. Now, those sums vary, and it depends upon what you're doing. There are some areas which are extremely expensive in proprietary software, <coughs> databases, for example, um, where there are huge cost savings available, up to 90%, I'm not kidding. Now it's a problem when you tell a business or an organisation that you can make 90% cost savings because they don't believe you. Or, or, they, yeah? or, or they think, no, but you know, where's the catch with it? Now, 
I'm not saying it's always 90%, by the way, but I am saying that organisations who had made 90% cost savings in the area of databases were introduced. <coughs> so we moved along and we got to the conversation is on what could we say? You know, what's a figure that we could say about how much we could save by wholesale adoption of open source in the public sector? Now, at this time, it's very, very unclear how much the government spent on proprietary software. The best estimates are around £13.5 billion pounds per annum. That's since been revised upwards several times. It's currently about £20 billion an annum. That's how much the public sector spends on IT each year. £20 billion. Put that into context, that's more than we spend on the Home Office, more than we spend on the Ministry of Justice, more than we spend on Wales. Right? <laughs> I mean, you're kidding? It's three times as much as we spend on the army. Now, I know where I'd rather the public money was spent on, right? In the hospital, even in the army, rather than on a that bigger. So, we had a conversation, how much can we say, how much can we say, can we say 90%? No, no, it not believe us. Can we say, blah, blah, blah. Um, we came up with, some of you might have seen this figure quoted in the press, um, and you might remember some years ago, George Osborne did this speech where he said, we're going to back open source and it will save £600 million pounds a year. This is the conversation where the £600 million pounds a year came out of, and it was based on a figure that we knew nobody would challenge. And guess what? Nobody did. Right? Now, a lot of people would want to challenge that figure, wouldn't they? But they didn't. Anyway, the conversation moved on, and um, various other things happened, and we looked into that, and then we had an election, and then the opposition became the government. So, how serious are they about open source? Well, the answer is very, very serious, but there are absolutely huge problems in the public sector. One of the problems um, is we had some open source policies, but they were absolutely not taken very seriously, apart from a few sort of very brave individuals who were pushing um, for adoption themselves. But widespread, no, absolutely not. And there were some policy problems as well. So for example, all of the procurement rules assume uh, that you're gonna be procuring proprietary software, and they kind of don't fit in the notion of open source. Um, and there are various, various different policies. So one of the first areas that was worked on was the area of policy. And one of the things which was needed was a um, proper open source, open standards policy. Some of you might have read some of the press around this and some of the stories about it. Cutting to the chase, the UK is unique currently in the world in that it has an open source, open standards policy which is guarantees royalty free. Now, this is important because the, the, um, in Europe and many other countries, they have a notion of open standards, which includes so-called FRAND, or Fair, Reasonable, and Non-Discriminatory um, Standards. It sounds good, doesn't it? Fair, Reasonable, and Non-Discriminatory. Great language. It sounds fair. It sounds reasonable. But what it means is it's okay to have a certain amount of restriction on some of the standards. Yeah? Now, for underlying open source projects, that's a problem because they get excluded by that kind of standards policy because they cannot comply to them. Because there are companies which sit around and are on open source and provide commercial services around it, but the underlying projects themselves are, and of course this is a benefit, free, and they can't comply with that policy. So, Government is pushing for a real open source and open standards policy. All sorts of really weird stuff happened, and if any of you have read some of the stories about it, they're great. Just one at random, the person, and I'm not going to name any names here, yeah, um, but the person who was chairing, uh, objectively, the committee for it, happened to be on the payroll of a certain large proprietary software provider. And that was undeclared. To its very great credit, the government, and specifically a chap called Liam Maxwell, who was involved in the initial discussions when we were first talking about open source, and he's now the government's CTO, and he'll come into the story a bit later, um, 
at the end of this review, it sent it back to the beginning because it was a flawed process. And it went through the process again, and this time it came out in the right way. And we have an um, open source, open standards policy, which is absolutely genuine and is not restricted in terms of royalty. It's very, very fair towards open source. Next problem. <laughs> um, so we got things sorted at, at the policy level, but that needs to feed down into practice and it needs to work its way through those sort of various uh, uh, different administrative things. Next problem is that government procurement is incredibly centralised in the UK, incredibly centralised, uh, uh, if you compare it with other governments around the world. And something like 80, 85% of all government spending goes to a handful of enormous providers. Now the truth about open source is that it's a new industry, relatively new industry. The truth is most of the providers are smaller <coughs> providers. We do have the world's first billion dollar open source company, Red Hat, there will be more. Um, but we're still a young industry. And the reality is that most of the innovation uh, in open source is coming from young, innovative, smaller providers. Utterly excluded from government procurement, except on the fringes. So the next big problem is um, procurement. And one of the reasons that we got involved in some of the pro uh, procurement questions was they were blockers to the adoption of open source in the public sector. So <laughs> that was a story as well. It went through various different, um, and I'll cut it nice and short, it went through various different panels, including the Public Administration Select Committee, um, which is a, a body in government designed to look at various different issues around the area. And they took submissions from various different companies, smaller and medium-sized ones, including lots and lots of open source companies, about whether they were excluded from IT procurement in the public sector. And the answer was yes, absolutely. The MP involved who chaired the committee, um, in his report, uh, described the situation in the UK public sector as an organised rip-off. And he described the incumbents in the public sector as an oligopoly. And that word was adopted immediately by the Cabinet Minister for the Cabinet Office, Francis Maud, who started referring to the situation that pertained in the public sector as an oligopoly. A small handful of providers excluding the others. So once all that's been decided, what needs it to be done about it? So a number of things have been done about it, and you may have read about some of them. One of them is a putting on hold the existing procurement contracts in place in the public sector. It's a very, very long-standing situation that the public sector is keen on procurement lists. And what that means is there's a handful of providers on this list, and if you buy from them, you don't need to go out to public tender, or you can just tender to this list. They're pre-authorised, pre and you, you can happily buy the stuff through them. I see some nodding heads, so people here are familiar with that. Yeah? Which is great, but it is hugely exclusive of smaller and medium-sized providers. So that was put a hold to. In its place, a number of new procurement routes have been created. Um, probably the best known, still in its very, very early days, um, is the G Cloud. It's a really, really poor name for it, because it, it sort of, you know, it conjures up and talking about cloud store and buying applications and stuff like that. It's not actually like that. It is a procurement list. It's a very, very lightweight procurement list. Uh, which I think something like 75, 80% of all of the providers on there for SMEs. Cut a long story short, um, G Cloud put together. Now, anyone here, any of the companies here on it yet? Good. Good. It's very, very early days, and it's only some millions that have gone through it. Um, but it is early days, and it is doubling at each iteration of it as well. For any other companies in the audience, I very, very much recommend you get onto it. Okay? Because it's dead serious and people are buying, and it's a very good route to market, and it, it's, uh, it's improving. So, and um, if you monitor the press, you'll see all sorts of pronouncements coming out from Francis Maud and Liam Maxwell and all these people about SMEs and SME tax and all of that kind of stuff. The agenda is absolutely real, they are dead serious about it, and we need to participate in, in it to help make it real. 
Now, I'm not promising you that it's going to change overnight. What I am telling you, and hopefully you got hint from some of the things that have read out and stuff, is that this goes really right to the top and it is a huge agenda and they're dead serious about pushing it in this direction, which means calling a whole halt to procurements which are not going this route and pushing the agenda of the smaller and medium-sized companies. Um, I need to speed up, so I'm going to very, very rapidly talk about some of, um, some of the adoption. Adoption in government is happening very, very rapidly. And just to name a few at random, um, anyone here, everyone here you remember the Olympics last year? There are a number of government departments involved <coughs> doing open source stuff around there. The Met Office have got hundreds and hundreds of Linux servers running Postgres and PostGIS and, and open source systems, and all the weather systems all the weather reports and everything like that across the Olympics will all run through that. There's other government departments and agencies. The Ordnance Survey have decided they're going to be going Apache, Lucene and Solar with their enterprise search, and all this kind of stuff. Anyone heard of GDS or the Government Digital Service? Great. There's probably a few of you who have done some work for them, maybe? Okay, good. Well, if not, get on the G Cloud and hopefully you will be saved. Um, GDS is the biggest case study in government of open source adoption. GDS was established by um, the Cabinet Office, it's called the Government Digital Service, and the purpose is to move government online. And there's a couple of things. Number one is collecting and consolidating all of the government websites, yeah? and there are hundreds of them, um, and they're all being moved into GDS. GDS are huge users of Groupal, by the way. So um, the actual the main gov.uk is... Um, all open source. In fact, everything that GDS does is open source. Everything, top to bottom, all of the software that they're using is open source. Yeah? Uh, the main gov.uk is a homebrew system. Um, it's got loads of open source in there. Apache, we're seeing solar and the disk stack and the other thing, and all the code in Git, and they're even open sourcing bits of it themselves. All the other sites, like data.gov and the mutuals information site, they're, they're running on Drupal. Cabinet Office's website is Drupal. Yeah, it's absolutely all over the place. Um, I mentioned earlier the cost benefits were one of the additional uh, attractions, but there's also the whole sort of transparency agenda and, and loads of stuff which open source is fitted naturally for. The first stage of GDS is moving all of the websites in and having a single portal for all government services. The next stage, which they're working on, is reducing the transaction costs of government as well. Part of that huge spend Every time we interact with the government, it's, they view it as a transaction. So whether you're renewing your parking disc online, or applying for <coughs> housing benefit, or whatever it is, those costs of transactions are enormous. Some of the, the, the costs of doing business with government can cost hundreds of pounds per transaction. And if you compare that to best practice in the, in the private sector, like I know Amazon, who use massive amounts of open source, by the way, obviously, um, it's a few pence. So they know that by using open source technologies to reduce uh, transaction costs can be made simpler, quicker, more effective, and reduce the cost massively. I'm going to finish off real soon now, then we're going to have coffee. And if you want to come and chat to me, I, I can talk about various different things with that. Um, but the next, so policy is sorted. Procurement is well on its way, and I, again, I encourage you to get onto G Cloud if you're not already looking at it or, or getting on, onto it. If not on this iteration, get onto the next one in a few months' time, as it, it is happening. Our government is moving systems over onto open source. The next frontier is the area of security. Um, one of the excuses which has been given by some people, and also to their shame, some organisations are claiming that open source is less secure than proprietary. Absolutely not the case. Um, so one of the things to look out for, there's a, um, I'm not giving too much away if I say there's a conference coming up in April called Open Source Open Standards in the public sector. One of the speakers at it is um, Dr Ian Levy, who's one of the directors of CEST, which is the UK Government Security Organisation. Um, they're the people who run GCHQ, and they're the people who do the secure communications and, and assure software and stuff like that. Um, Dr. Levy is speaking about the security aspects of open source software, and is announcing uh, UK government assured open source software as well. 
So if you read between the lines, you've probably got a hint of what's coming up next. Final thing I want to say is I want to talk about us. The opportunities in business have never been so great now. Open source it is accepted as the valid way of doing software. Not a day goes by when there isn't something in some newspaper, Fortune or Forbes or The Economist, about open source ideas. We now have the huge area of government opportunity opening up. We as an industry need to be ready. One of the challenges with open source, I hate the stereotypes around it, I've heard them for decades, but some of the stereotypes we need to bear in mind, and some of, one of them is that open source people are a little bit geeky and into the technology and religious wars about BSD, GB out, BSD, GB out. We need to be ready and we need to be professional. One of the reasons I said yes to speaking at this conference is that I see the True Power community as an exemplar of professionalism in open source. It is not quite unique, but it's near to unique. You guys, and, and please bear with me, I'm talking to the, not the whole, I'm talking to members of the audience who are part of the Drew Power community, you're doing a good job. And the Drew Power <coughs> Association and these kind of events is great. This is the kind of professionalism we need to see in open source in order to, to move even further. A couple of months ago, I was speaking in Paris, and I'd been invited over to speak at their economics ministry, and the first speaker was their economics minister, and minister for digital engagement, and this event, incredibly smooth, had been organised by the open source community in France, and they had had themselves organised, they worked with the minister, they got the economics ministry ready for it, it was attended by business people and, and agency departments and stuff like that. And I looked at us in the UK, and we are quite a way away from being that organised and, and that efficient. In Drupal here, I can see it, but in the wider open source community, there's a way to go. So the thought I want to leave you with is that the opportunities in front of us for business and government have never been this great, but we need to be ready for them. Yeah? So, yes, we've got the great technology, but we need to get very, very clear on the other tools of business, our marketing, our sales, our organisation, our accounting. We need to work together as well. Yeah? So, yes, we're SMEs, and SMEs can do great things, and we can work for big businesses, but this kind of event and this kind of working together is very much needed. We need to be building an industry here. Because I'm telling you, Customers, if there's just one company that they can buy from, they're scared of it. If they can see an industry there, and they can see an industry that's professional and well-organized, and they cooperate where necessary, they know they're safe to place their business with us. Because if one particular provider can't help, there are others in place. So my message to you is <coughs> the state of business and government has never been this good, but we need to get our acts together and be ready for it. Thank you very much for listening.